Um, so Krogan and Sayer kind of revived the concept of moral regulation. And then in the 1990s, it's picked up by a number of scholars um, who are a little bit more Foucauldian in terms of their orientation. Uh, Mitchell Dean, Alan Hunt, uh, Hanu Ranavara. Uh, the last two are particularly work, the last two I drew on their work particularly. Um, they emphasise a couple of things. I suppose partly they emphasise that moral regulation isn't just done by the state. It can be done by other groups. It can be done by churches, by schools, um, by, by uh, medical professionals, by psychiatrists, by lots of other groups can carry out moral regulation. But they also introduce this concern with, um, with self-formation. So moral regulation ceases to be just about the business of the state and what the state's doing. It also becomes... Uh, a slightly more, well, it becomes about changing how people see themselves, okay, and how people, um, yeah, how people see themselves and thus trying to change people's behaviour through changing their self perception. So, as Ranavara uh, describes here, moral regulation is a special kind of social control. Its target is how people see themselves and their ways of life. So, it's based around, for, for Alan Hunt and Hanu Ranavara, I think, as well, moral regulation becomes based around a normative judgment that a certain type of conduct is in some sense wrong, and then a variety of efforts made to compel people to cease engaging in that form of conduct. And those uh, those efforts, those forms of compulsion could perhaps be legal. They could involve some legal coercion, some legal prohibition, which forces people to change behaviour, but they can also involve persuasive techniques, persuading people to change their own behaviour. Um, so I think the, the significance of that will perhaps become clear as I go along, but it's moral regulation is then, as far as I use it, it's about ways in which people are compelled to change. More broadly, perhaps, it's a social relation. It's about how individuals and groups relate to each other within society. Okay, so to, to introduce a little bit about the, the, the temperance movement. Um, the temperance movement gets started in Britain in the late 1820s, and the first societies are formed in, in 1829, um, instigated by the uh, formation of similar societies in, in the United States. And initially they're concerned with promoting abstinence from alcoholic spirits, or they're concerned with promoting... Uh, I just realised I'm keep standing in front there. Um, you could have told me. Um, or they're concerned with promoting moderation from alcohol. They're certainly not concerned uh, primarily with beer drinking or wine drinking in their very early stages. The movement gathers a lot of momentum and changes shape, particularly in the aftermath of the Beer Act 1830. And the Beer Act was quite a significant uh, uh, legal reform because what it does is it, is it rules that people selling beer, ale or cider no longer need a licence granted by a local magistrate. That being the case in England um, from the 1550s onwards. The Beer Act is, is inspired really by, by free trade ideas. Um, it's partly inspired actually also by uh, a suspicion of the corruption of the local magistracy so they perhaps can't be trusted with this responsibility. But also it's, it's motivated by free trade, the idea being that actually drunkenness will be decreased if um, we make it easier for people to produce and sell their own beer. The price will go down, the quality will go up, people will stop drinking harmful drinks, particularly like gin, and they will consume a lot more beer, which is perhaps better, and so will lead to moderation. Um, so it was, it, was, it was roughly a free trade piece of legislation, very controversial, very unpopular. Um, and most people, both contemporary and, and historical, will regard it as, as quite unsuccessful. Um, but in the context of opposing the Beer Act, the temperance movement just starts to change, and it turns very much into a teetotal movement. Um, drinking comes to be understood as, as a slippery slope, and people begin to recognise that beer, as well as uh, spirits, um, can have very negative consequences. They begin to see negative consequences, which had long been associated with drink. So things like uh, poverty, sickness, crime, insanity. These things had long been associated with drink. But for teetotalers in the, in, in the 1830s, these things come to be seen as the inevitable consequence of any amount of alcohol consumption whatsoever. So even moderate drinkers and even beer drinkers soon find that they're, as, as W. Hunt, who is a teetotaler, says, soon find that their giddy heads quickly sink in the deep waters of intemperance, perhaps to rise no more. Um, these pictures here are, are, are by um, George Cruikshank, the Victorian illustrator. And um, this is from a, a bigger series he did called The Bottle, but the point is that um, this is the first 
drink of alcohol on the right here. It's a very quite a, quite a happy looking scene, you know, a wealthy looking family. Uh, father inviting the family to come around and join him and have a drink of something from the bottle. But of course, things go slowly and terribly wrong, and it ends with with violence, as you can see here, but also um, uh, insanity and, and death ultimately. So that's that's the slippery slope. Drinking, all forms of drinking are problematic, and it puts you on a slippery slope. For these early temperance or activists, or these early teetotalers from the in the 1830s and 1840s, the solution is about promoting voluntary teetotalism. So they, they try to encourage people to take a teetotal pledge. Um, that involves a routine of individual self-control, self-discipline, which is thought would be uh, which would, would stop them ever setting foot on that slippery slope. It would have certain benefits, and they tried to sell it to people on certain benefits. It would confer moral strength upon people. Resisting temptation makes you strong, it gives you fortitude. But they also talked about more, more perhaps tangible, material benefits. It would make you richer, you have more money to spend on other things. It would make you healthier, um, it would make your family happier, because, and, and it was focused largely on men, because you won't be in the pub um, in the evenings, you'll be at home with your family. Um, this is a, an advert for chocolate from um, the 1880s, uh, so a bit later than I'm talking about, but it's quite typical of the kind of images which these moral persuasions uh, circulated during this period. So here we have intemperance and poverty, a quite miserable scene, uh, clearly quite a poor family, shabby looking room, shabby clothes, everyone looks very miserable, um, and the, the, the man is stood there holding, slouched against the wall, holding a bottle presumably of something alcoholic. But juxtaposed with that, we've got temperance and prosperity, okay? We've got a family who have chosen instead to drink cocoa chocolate, and they are clearly healthier, wealthier, and much, much happier. So these kind of techniques were used to promote the teetotal pledge, to try and encourage people, to persuade people to adopt this routine of voluntary uh, uh, self-discipline as a solution to the problem of drink. This becomes the... This is the dominant strand of temperance in the 1830s and 1840s. It begins to be challenged in the 1850s by prohibitionism. <coughs> Again, prohibitionism in the UK is instigated um, by developments in the US. Prohibition develops there first, and then people in the UK start, to, uh, start to, to, to form similar groups, such as the UK Alliance, which was the main prohibitionist campaign group in the UK. They were less concerned with inculcating self-control and self-disciplining people. They had much more concern with what they regarded or what they called the legal, legalised system of temptation which creates this desire to drink in the first place. Samuel Pope was a, a prohibitionist leader in the 1850s um, and he didn't deny necessarily that the world would be a better place if everyone had that uh, fortitude, that self-control that's needed to just resist the temptation of drink whatsoever. Um, but he, he asked how the people to reach that state, how to acquire that habit in the midst of the sad and sorrowful circumstances which surround them. Uh, moral force is not enough for the world as it is. So for Pope and others, um, the state needed to step in. It needed to use the law to prohibit alcohol, to enforce some kind of behavioural reformation upon people. Now prohibitionism becomes the dominant strand in UK temperance, um, certainly by the 1860s, and continues to be so um, for, for the rest of the 19th century. There are other forms of UK temperance, and some that are related but a little bit different, some that are a bit more medically interested, some that are a little bit more uh, socialist in flavour and interested in state management of the, the alcohol trade and things like that. Um, but the two main strands of moral suasionism and then for the second half of the 19th century, prohibitionism. Now, of course, as, we've all, as we know, anyway, prohibition wasn't achieved. Okay? So you begin to see how uh, Jessica Warner and others reached that conclusion. Um, prohibition became the dominant strand, but prohibitionism was never achieved. But the British temperance movement did achieve some legal reforms. Um, I don't really look at Scotland in my research, but I, I wanted to flag this up because I think it's important anyway if we're talking about a British temperance movement. Um, the Temperance Scotland Act 1913 sets up a series of local polls, areas in Scotland, if enough people petitioned the local authorities asking for a referendum to be held in that area, a referendum would be held, and if a big enough majority voted in favour of prohibition, that area would go dry. Um, 
it came into effect after, after World War I um, and stayed in effect until uh, the 1970s. Very few areas actually voted to go dry. But this was a fairly significant piece of legislation. The significance, I think, lies in the fact that really since the 1860s, this has been what UK prohibitionists had campaigned for. They called it the local veto. They wanted lo people in local areas to have some kind of democratic veto over the drinks industry. Some people regard this as a, an indication that the British temperance movement is a bit more, a bit less ambitious, a bit less utopian, a little bit flakier than the American counterpart, where prohibition was simply something uh, imposed by, by the national government. Um, I, I disagree with that, uh, primarily because if you read what the prohibitionists wrote in the 19, 19, uh, sorry, the 19th century, they believe very passionately that if, if you give people the option to vote on this, they will vote overwhelmingly in favour of prohibition. It's a bit hard to get your head around from a modern point of view, but they often articulate it in reference to, to slavery. Um, and there was some overlap between temperance and abolitionism. But they, they, they saw... Um, they saw drinkers as people who'd been enslaved by publicans and by brewers, and they firmly believed that if you give people the opportunity to, to throw off the chains of drink, that they would seize it with both hands. Um, so Temperance Scotland Act, certainly obviously in Scotland, is very significant, a very big achievement for the temperance movement in that, um, in, in that country. Uh, we also had Sunday closing coming in, in Scotland and in Wales. Again, this was a key demand of many temperance groups. Uh, so I think, again, shows some uh, legal success. And we did have restricted hours of sale in England, um, although we never had full Sunday closing. It was, it was much more controversial in England than it was in the, uh, the Celtic fringes of Britain. Um, so the temperance movement did achieve some things. It's a little bit unfair to say that it, it accomplished very little. It did achieve some of its uh, legal demands. I think there's perhaps a little bit more to be said, however, for some of the other things that happened at the time, which weren't necessarily campaigned for that vigorously by any temperance group, but did nonetheless happen and did, were in some sense instigated by them. Because what the British temperance movement did, uh, whatever strand of it we're talking about, is they made drink a massive public issue. This was a gigantic social movement, it had millions of members, it spanned across Britain and across many other countries. They campaigned vociferously to raise awareness about the problem of alcohol. Um, and while they did manage to get some of the more extreme measures that many of their many prohibitionists wanted from uh, the legislature, they did make drink an issue that had to be tackled. So there were a lot of licenses, or there were a, a series of licensing reforms between about 1864 and 1872 that I think are very significant. Um, firstly, the Wine and Beer Houses Act. This scraps the free trade system set up by the Beer Act 1830, so it means that everyone selling any kind of alcohol needs some kind of license. Um, the Public House Closing Acts further restrict the availability of alcohol. They introduce the first statutory closing time on public houses in, uh, in, in Britain, uh, bar on Sunday. Um, and um, perhaps the most important piece of legislation is the Licensing Act 1872. So this, um, this further, well it reiterates the requirement for anyone selling any form of alcohol to have a license granted by a magistrate. It uh, tightens up closing times further so that pubs have to shut at either 10, 11 or 12 depending on uh, what part of the country they're in. Um, and it does a number of very interesting things. It creates the modern drunkenness offences. So simple drunkenness, which is being drunk in a public place, and drunkenness with some form of aggravation, which is a slightly more serious criminal. Uh, that was created by this, this piece of legislation. It also imposes the first national age restrictions on the sale of alcohol. It prohibits under 16s from buying spirits for consumption on licensed premises. Not particularly uh, uh, far, far reaching regulation in its own right, but something which was expanded on and built upon with many, many other age restrictions in, uh, uh, subsequently. Um, and it massively increases the police power to deal with drinking. Uh, for example, it gives the police for the first time the power to enter licensed premises without the explicit invitation of the person who owns that premises. So what I think this shows is this shows a, a complete abandonment, certainly, of the free trade approach to alcohol, which had been uh, uh, prominent previously in governmental terms. And I think perhaps more interestingly, it shows, or it seems to show, some kind of acceptance of the temperance movement's basic belief in the essentially problematic nature of all forms of alcohol. 
it's beer as well as spirits like gin that are being regulated here. Um, alcohol in all its forms, its sale and supply needs to be restricted and the behaviour of those consuming it needs to be regulated. That's what these uh, pieces of legislation say to me at least. So I think that they show the iteration in law of the problematisation of all forms of alcohol which the, the teetotal term the British temperance movement created. <coughs> I go a little bit further in saying, in terms of looking at the uh, perhaps the long-term impact of this piece of legislation, because the Licensing Act 1872 is, is, is pretty much the basis of the system for governing alcohol in England and Wales, and is so uh, to this day. Although not that much of it remains in effect, the frameworks it's set up remain in the sense that um, who can sell alcohol, uh, at what time alcohol can be bought and sold. Um, who can buy alcohol to some degree in terms of age and what people uh, can do after consuming it are still stuff that's regulated either by statutory law or by some other organ of the state, such as a licensing commission, for example. Um, so it normalises the expectation that those things will be regulated. Furthermore, I would add, it normalises the... Uh, well, no, I'll come back to that point. It normalises the expectation that certain things will be regulated, certain things will be restricted. They won't be prohibited, as many people like Samuel Pope would campaign for, they will be uh, restricted instead. Mr. German was a, a, a liberal MP. I'm still, I don't know what his first name is. I can only find references to him as Mr. Um, but he was, uh, he was talking in support of the Licensing Act 1872. And he said, and it was very often, very often said at the time, that you can't make people sober by Act of Parliament. Um, but what Mr. German was saying you can do is limit the temptation uh, which people face using the law. So he was talking about creating closing times of 11 o'clock and saying that would limit the temptation because the hour between 11 and 12 is a time of temptation. So it was a positive move to restrict those temptations. So this, this Licensing Act 872, 872 particularly sets up this idea of the law as restrictive in reference to alcohol rather than uh, uh, prohibitive. It also normalises this expectation that the law will not be the limit of behavioural regulation. Uh, I don't know what that little thing was to call that is. But, oh, it's gone. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it normalises the expectation that the state will go further than the law. So Henry Bruce was the Home Secretary who created this, this Act of Parliament. Um, and Bruce, while he resisted prohibitionist demands and left people the legal freedom to drink within certain parameters, tightened parameters. He was very clear that he didn't approve of drunkenness. He didn't approve of drinking to excess. Um, he described drunkenness or intemperance as a blot on our social system and a disgrace to our civilization. Uh, he was a big believer in self-help. He was a big believer in, the, uh, as he says at the quote at the bottom, says improving the intelligence and morality of the people in order to help people help themselves. So for Bruce, individual citizens weren't um, simply the products of a bigger social environment. Individual citizens were actively engaged. They were agents of their own behavioural self-reform. Self and so if you give them the intelligence, the morality, and the slightly restricted temptation, they will better themselves. They will reform their own behaviour. Um, Lord Kimberley, who promoted the Act in the House of Lords, made very similar statements. Um, Particularly, he talked about what he wanted the temperance movement to do, and he wanted the temperance movement, within these new legal parameters established, to go further in educating people, and in his words, to persevere in spreading the rules of temperance as far as they can. Um, so behavioural regulation didn't end at the limits of the law in 1872. What I might say about this act is that I think that these, the, the acceptance of the problematic nature of alcohol shows some degree of temperance influence. I further add that the values of persuasion and education and trying to make individual citizens reform their own behaviour suggest some degree of symmetry between this, this legal system or this governmental system established and the ideas of moral suasionist rather than prohibitionist temperance. So I think uh, to, to, to come back to my earlier point, we need to recognise the nuanced nature of the British temperance movement and think about moral suasionism as something which influenced <coughs> governmental decisions as well. And I'd argue in terms of the long-term influence that, as I've said, we still have basically the same system. We still have uh, a system where drinking 
within certain parameters is legal. Uh, binge drinking, the target of much contemporary uh, debate, target for many contemporary policies, is also generally legal. There's nothing explicitly illegal about binge drinking per se. So these are legal activities, but they're officially disapproved of activities. And the, the disapproval is shown in many ways. I, I've, I've put four here, I perhaps could have gone on. People are regularly told to limit their consumption to certain amounts of alcoholic units. Um, people are increasingly exhorted by labels on cans and bottles and taglines on, on drinks adverts to drink responsibly. Um, Tax is also used, and the coalition government have been very clear in explaining that they're trying to use taxation, excise duties imposed on alcohol, to clamp down on what they regard as problematic drinking. Um, and perhaps most notably, in terms of this, this, this paper I've written in my doctoral research, the extensive moralising rhetoric which surrounds the use of alcohol, which I'm sure everyone has, has perhaps seen examples of in the press, um, <clears throat> I've got an example from, from the, the alcohol strategy last year. David Cameron's forward to it. <coughs> Excuse me. He says that binge drinking is a serious problem which causes a scourge of violence. It drains, our, drains resources in our hospitals, it generates mayhem on our streets, and it spreads fear in our communities. Um, now, this type of rhetoric makes it clear that while binge drinking is a legal activity, um, it's officially disapproved of. Okay, so the choice of whether to drink and whether to binge drink isn't a free one in any uh, classically liberal sense. It's a normatively structured choice. People have the legal freedom to drink, but they're told what's the right choice within those legal freedoms, uh, within that, the, the, the space that the law allows. So where legal censure ends, moral censure continues, and that continues to structure people's choices, just as it did in 1872. Um, I perhaps won't dwell on this because I don't think I've got... Uh, well, I've got a little bit of time. Um, but, yes, I've, I've skipped over a lot of history here, and I'm not trying to say, obviously, that nothing changed between 1872 and the present day. That's clearly not true. I just wanted to say with this slightly silly uh, diagram, but legal restriction and moral compulsion jointly are used to govern the consumption of alcohol in, uh, in England and Wales. Um, there are some notable issues that emerge in the uh, mid-20th century, which I haven't covered here today. Youth and drink driving, these are ones I've written about more extensively in um, my PhD, which is coming out as a book next year. Uh, youth emerges as an issue, drink driving emerges as an issue. They don't necessitate any, any fundamental reshaping of uh, what I would call this basic governmental model. Um, all that happens is legal restriction and moral compulsion just become more targeted on these particular activities. The system still remains. Um, the biggest real threat at the moment I see is, is, is the, the, this idea of minimum unit pricing, um, which is going ahead in Scotland as far as uh, I can tell at least, but there's some doubt about whether it will happen in England now, um, certainly this side of the next election. Uh, minimum unit pricing represents a threat to this system because it, it doesn't in any way seek to activate voluntary self-reform. It's based around uh, using pricing mechanisms to price certain people out of certain drinks. Okay, so in that sense it owes a lot more to prohibitionist ideas than it does necessarily to more suasionist ideas. So it, it, it represents something different. If that comes in, this system that's been since 1872, I think will be quite significantly changed. Okay, so I will sum up, um, and I suppose this is, I, I kind of made this point in the beginning, but I just wanted to come back to it. The temperance movement wasn't just about prohibition in Britain, and so it can't be reduced just to a campaign for legal regulation. The search for any British equivalent to the 18th Amendment is therefore misguided. Um, and the overfocus on prohibitionism, uh, what I would argue is an overfocus in history and within social science, neglects the broader project of moral reform and extra legal regulation. Um, which the temperance movement and other groups have been engaged in surrounding alcohol. Um, and, and as I've also flagged up, moral suasionism deserves a little bit of attention in terms of the formative impact it's had over the system for governing alcohol in this country. Um, and this, this, this point at the end here, I, I kind of left it in because it was quite relevant when I made it, uh, quite pertinent, I think, when I made it at the British Legal History Conference. Um, that it's, it's about a sociological understanding of temperance as a social movement that's facilitated this uh, conclusion, particularly using this concept of moral regulation. 
at this conference, I don't think I really need to praise the value of sociology to any of you. Um, but just to say that, yeah, it's using this, this concept that has, uh, that has enabled this conclusion. So, thank you very much. Thank you.